Thanks, everyone. Hi. Um, so the, the obvious question is, what, what, what on earth is Zeta Linux, and uh, why, why is it not too late to start? Uh, so Zeta Linux is, is simply a term I made up. Um, I'm, I'm kind of riffing on the whole exascale thing that the US government is talking about right now. Uh, you know, they're trying to get to uh, two to the 60 levels of performance. And so the question is, what comes after that? Well, if you look at the alphabet, uh, exa comes before zeta. Um, so I'm looking at what, what happens when we run out of 64-bit. Uh, when, when, when is 64-bit not, not good enough for computing? Um, and, and, and a lot of people are going to say, oh, Oh, come on, that, that, that's going to be years away. And the answer is, actually, well, yes, it is, but there's good reasons to start now um, because we, we don't want to get caught wishing we'd started earlier. So, so is it too early to start? No, it's not too early to start, but it's not too late to start either. In fact, now is, is just right. Um, I, sh I, I left this slide in because I really want to see, this is not an Oracle product thing. I have no control over Oracle products. I, I, didn't, I didn't want any journalists to get overly excited about this and say, oh my god, Oracle's go. No, no, no. Like, this is something that we as an industry need to be doing. Um, so why? What, what, what problems am I trying to evolve here, avoid here? Um, some of you may remember the 32 to 64-bit transition. That happened sort of in the, in the mid-90s. Um, and there were a lot of, um, so there, there were several different pressures around, uh, you know, why, why did we need to transition from 32-bit to 64-bit? Uh, one was file sizes. And so we had this thing called the, uh, the Large File Summit that concluded around about 1995. Um, and uh, we, we, we had some of these awful things around, you know, having an L off T as well as an off T and just all kinds of dreadful things around um, people had to modify their source code in order to support 64 bit files on 32 bit systems. And we had, you know, double L C L L seek. I just don't want to see us come up with L L L seek, right? Let, let, let's try and avoid that. <laughs> I mean, really, we're trying to reduce the cost for the entire industry here. We, we, we're looking to impose some cost on some companies in order to avoid larger costs for the whole system. In fact, some of these problems we're still dealing with today, not so much you know, 64-bit files because now we've all got 64-bit CPUs, but some of us are still using 32-bit CPUs with more than four, mega, four gigabytes of memory, which is the second bullet there. I, I don't want us to have config high mem on 64-bit systems. Those of you who don't work on file systems or don't work on memory management may not understand that there is a real significant cost to still carrying around all of the legacy support for, um, for, for these 32-bit systems with large amounts of memory. And people are still manufacturing them today. <laughs> right? the, 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 the first systems that had uh, support, yes, exactly, Keith. Your, your, your employer is still manufacturing this today. Please stop. Uh, billions. Billions of devices are still shipping 32-bit with more than four gigabytes of memory. It's, it's really sad, and it needs to stop. Um, but let's not get there again with 128-bit. Let's transition the entire ecosystem over to 128-bit before we get to the point where we need to do that. So. The obvious solution is 128-bit general purpose registers. Now, 128-bit registers are not actually a new thing, right? Um, Intel's had them in CPUs for 15 years or something, right? Like the, the, the Pentium 2 or Pentium 3 had a 128-bit register. But they're not general purpose registers, they're special purpose registers, they're MMX registers or they're AVX registers or whatever acronym soup Intel's chosen to use this week. Um, what Intel don't have is a 128-bit ALU. They don't have the ability to do arbitrary arithmetic on a 128-bit number. They treat that 128-bit register as containing 264-bit or 432-bit or whatever. Right. So we need 128-bit registers with 128-bit arithmetic in order to use them as base registers for pointers, for example. So when are we going to need this? Well. I, 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 I went off and did some research, and yeah, it's probably going around about 2040 that we need it for file sizes. Um, I wanted to draw a little sop to the CPU people here. We don't need huge amounts of, a, of we don't need like multiplication of two 128-bit numbers. I mean, they're probably going to do it because 
you want orthogonality in your instruction set. But actually, if you, if you want to know what needs to be fast about this, then it's some simple operations. It's shifts, addition, subtraction, comparison. These are not hard things to do. It's not like we need a 128-bit multiplier that's as fast as a 64-bit multiplier. I'm okay if that's slow. Um, sorry, was that a question? No, you just... I'm sorry? Uh, the comment in the room was, shift is hard. <clears throat> um, so that's file sizes. What about user address spaces? Oh, that looks like it's around about 2035 as well. Okay, all right, so two things happening around about 2035. This, this seems like we're going to need to get it in place for 2035. Uh, and then I talked to Case Cook about this, and I was like, yeah, you know, we're, we're going to need this in 2035. We should probably start on this in three to five years. There will be plenty of time to get it all in place before, um, be before we actually need it. And he was like, no, oh my God, no. We need this right now. We, need, we are running out of bits in, um, in our pointers. We need lots more bits in our pointers. Um, if you look at uh, things like the Cherry project, they're already using 129 bits, in fact, in, in uh, their, um, their fat pointers or um, authenticated pointers. Capabilities, their capability pointers. Um, but even for those of us who are not using an experimental um, system, like on your laptop right now, you're probably using address space, land, address space layout randomization, ASLR. Um, we use address space bits to give us more security. So we, 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 we choose random places in the address space to put, um, to put uh, files and memory, and uh, that makes it hard for attackers to find the things that would let them successfully attack our systems. And that's good, but the more bits you have, the more effective it is. And um, if we use larger TLB entries, and we want to use larger TLB entries for efficiency, then um, that reduces the effectiveness of ASLR. So if we had larger address spaces, we would get more of both of these different kinds of, um, of security. Now, another way that we're, sorry, I, I skipped a step there. The, the second kind of, so one, one kind of security is ASLR. Uh, the other kind is, goes by a different set of acronyms, depending on your CPU and, and, you know, because we can't all share the same acronyms, of course. You know, ADI, TBI, LAM, MTE. I can't even remember what half of these acronyms stand for. But they're, they're all basically the same thing, which is that we take some of the high bits of the pointer and we put a certain amount of information in there. And whether it's checked by hardware or by software, the more bits you have that are used to authenticate your pointer, the, uh, the more effective it is. And that authentication can be various different things like, you know, just am I accessing a freed pointer? And so you, 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 you look at the bits in your pointer and you compare it to the generation number of the memory you're looking at. And if, that's, if they mismatch, then clearly you're referencing a freed bit of memory, which is bad, as I think we all know. Um, so Cherry is an interesting project. Um, I, I, I've, I've been talking to some of the Cherry architects. Um, I don't understand it well enough to talk in detail about Cherry, but basically they're using a lot of extra bits in order to give you security um, with your pointers. You make sure that you really are referencing the thing that you're supposed to be referencing, and it's supposed to make it impossible to guess a pointer. You should not be able to manufacture a pointer to something that you do not have access to. Um, so that's really cool in and of itself, but they're not doing anything for, um, so, so they're using extra bits in the pointer and they want that, but it doesn't do anything for the, for the address space crunch. So if we spend a lot of effort to support Cherry, we may end up having to do a whole bunch more work later on in order to do the address space crunch. So, you know, we should do the work to make sure, if we're, if we're going to do these changes, let's fix everything all at once. So, how does this look inside the kernel? And I'm kind of assuming that I'm talking to kernel programmers at this point. Um, 
So on, on 32 bit, we have this model called ILP32, where everything is 32 bit, except that we have this get out clause called long long, which originally wasn't part of the C language, but then everyone added it. So the C, the C spec people added it to the language. Uh, so long long is 64 bit, and that's how we do um, access to 64 bit files. Um, on 64 bit, we uh, the type long is now 64 bits in size, pointers are 64 bits in size. So this is called I32 LP64, or just LP64 for short. So what model should we have for 128 bit? Like when, when we're programming a 128 bit CPU, what's our C programming model? Initially, I had thought for this, this third option, uh, we would leave into 32 bits, uh, we'd leave long at 64 bits. Pointers would now be 128 bits in size, of course. I mean, there's no point in doing this if we don't do that. And uh, long, long would also be expanded along with pointers to be 128 bits in size. This seems like an obvious model, and you know we've we've, we've used all the C types up to this point, and uh, we're done. Um, some people also propose that we add long, 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 which is 128 bits. <laughs> no, that's going too far. Stop it. <laughs> Um, but uh, Linus quite correctly pointed out that I, I, I was uh, not really thinking straight. The, the assumption we have inside Linux is that long is the size of a CPU register. Um, and if our CPU registers are 128-bit, then obviously long also has to be 128-bit because all kinds of stuff we do with the long, which is, you know, we, we, we say, oh, this is a long, we will now search it for a set bit, or this is a, a, this is a long, we will take a CPU register and we will um, stick it in, in there. And not to mention the assumptions we have that the size of a pointer is the size of a long. So, in that case, int32, long pointer 128. Now, the, now we've got a different problem, which is that we now have no type, which is 64 bits in size. There's nothing between int and long. I, I don't think we're going to get any support from the C committee to add a medium. So, but I, I think we can probably ask the compiler people nicely and get a double underscore int 64 underscore t. They've already added a double underscore int 128 t so that people on 64-bit systems can talk about quantities which are 128 bits in size. Um, there is not support on 32-bit systems for 128 bits. So you're probably never going to be able to cross-compile something from 32-bit to 128-bit, but I, I, I think we're going to be okay with that. <laughs> Seems like a reasonable restriction. Um, do we have any compiler people in the room? I asked a couple to come along, but uh, nobody's raising their hands. So either they're scared or uh, they, they had other talks to go to. Um, so along with that, I mean, using double underscore int underscore 64t, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of messy. Um, so I'm actually going to suggest to people that we switch to Rust types. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Rust, um, int becomes i32, uh, which I actually like, right? It, 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 it's a reminder to you, this is not an integer. This is not an abstract mathematical concept of an integer. This is a 32-bit quantity. This is going to have behavior when you get to the limits and it's going to wrap or it's going to fold or it's going to something. Uh, the other thing I really like about Rust types is that they chose the same uh, name for unsigned int that, that, that we did. Uh, inside the kernel, we use u32 when there's something specifically 32 bits in size. Um, yes, I have a question. Why? Doesn't it work? Yeah. Right, yes. uh, why don't you use uh, std int dot h? <laughs> Um, I, I, I shouldn't laugh. Uh, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not laughing at. I'm not laughing at the person who's asking the question. I'm laughing because uh, this, this, this is this is something which has come up many times. Um, it, 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 it's so to a certain extent. This, this question has been asked and answered uh, by Linus, and he has said we are not doing that. We're not going to be doing uh, std int. I forget the details of why, but there are differences between what the C standard committee has decreed for std int.h and what uh, the rest of us do. Ted, do you happen to remember? I, 
Oh, you do. Oh, Keith, Keith remembers. Fantastic. The key difference between student and what the kernel does is uh, that on, in student on a 64-bit system, uh, 64-bit system, uh, a 64-bit type is a long, and in the kernel, a 64-bit uh, value is an int. And that means that if you print a a a 64-bit value in the kernel, you need to use percent %d. And with student int, you often have to use percent %ld. Right. Not because they're different sizes, but because they are uh, different types. They're different types. They, yes, they happen to have the same size. But yes. they're different. Actually, and this I, is a I, bug I, in student int, I, not I, a bug I, in the kernel. I, I, I think you got that slightly wrong. I think it's long versus long, long, because they happen oh, to yeah, be the yeah. same size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is that when you print a student, you have to use PRI 64 or whatever it is. Uh, where, where, whereas, you know, we actually like to have code that's readable inside the kernel. Yeah. I understand why the C committee made the decisions they did, but we were able to make better decisions because we control all of our own source code. The other, uh, the other reason why, practically speaking, Linus is against using student is that student is under the control of the compiler and on some compiler implementations pound including student in drags in a truly awesome number of header files which uh we would prefer not to do yeah um we actually have problems on um E even even without stood in, we actually have problems on some architectures where size t is defined as being long, and other most architectures stood size t is long. But on some architectures, size t is int, and this causes compile warnings, and therefore the compile breaks, and it's 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 unnecessary pain. Um, so we should probably try and. Um, we, 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 we should probably, I mean, I'd like to be, able to, to be able to get that fixed again. There's no compiler people in the room, so I'm not talking to the right people, but it would be really nice if we could have, you know, a compiler flag that says, no, I understand that int and long are the same size, but make size t a long and not an int. Anyway, discussion for another time. Um, yeah, so, so Rust actually has all of the types that we want and need, and frankly, we should just switch to them. And it's going to make people more comfortable when you know switching between reading Rust code and reading C code if everyone's using the same type system. And the only the only real difference is that the kernel uses S32 and Rust uses I32. That's similarly I64, S64 for the for the signed types. Um, I, I, we we should just give up on S32 and, and use I32. Just be the same as everybody else. I mean, who cares? Um, yeah, and, and use it, some places we're using long explicitly to or long long explicitly to mean a one a 64 bit type, and that's something we're going to have to change and make sure that we're using uh, a U64 or an I64. Um, that's that's just a, a new uh, something that will become a bug on a 128 bit system. And while I'm ranting about in kernel types, I wanted to say that in a whole uh, usually when, oh, Keith, yep. Would you say that the kernel should just switch to using specific sized types for every variable? Not for every variable. Why not? I, I, I think, well, because sometimes your variable does depend on the word length of the CPU. I and size. for those, you should use uh, I size and U size. Yeah, explicitly, yeah, one of these explicit types, not any of the core C types. No no char, short, int, long, or long, long. I, I, I would be in favor of doing those kinds of conversions. I would not be in favor of seeing giant patch series from random people with random email addresses saying, here's a patch that converts all of the types in this driver. I would be in favor of uh, maintainers of code converting to it gradually over time. Um, yes, and so uh, in, in a number of places, we use unsigned long as the type for this is a user a virtual address. Um, and I would like us to add a U adra T to say, uh, and this is not an unsigned ad I mean, address is always unsigned, but in, specifically the U in this case would mean user address type. Um, 
just because there's a whole bunch of things which are an unsigned long. I've mentioned a lot of them already. It, it, it probably makes a lot of sense to just uh, use UADRA T. One of the things that the Cherry people have impressed upon me is that there is a distinction to be made between a user address and a user pointer. So if you're in a driver and the, the uh, uh, in your, your IOCTL command, you have received a pointer from user space and you're going to write to it, that's a pointer. If you have taken a page fault and you're going to be installing a page into the page tables to say, yes, this will satisfy the page fault, that's an address. So if you're writing to it, it is a pointer. If you're just dealing with it, it's an address. And going backwards, you, you can't turn an address into a pointer because a pointer is authenticated. You can tell whether a pointer belongs to you or whether the underlying memory behind it has been freed and, and you know, now it's no long, you're no longer supposed to be able to access it. It's, it's a fairly subtle distinction. It takes people a while to really get their heads around it. But it's, it's a distinction that I would like us to start making inside the kernel because I think it's generally a good way to be thinking about these kinds of things. Whether or not Cherry is a success in the marketplace or not, I think it's, it's a useful thing for people to get their heads around the distinction. Any more questions about users, about in, in kernel types before I move on? Okay. So we have a compatibility layer inside Linux. In general, you're allowed to run 32-bit processors on a 64-bit kernel. This is very important, right? They're, they're, for a long time, you know, applications were not being built in user space under 64-bit. I still have a number of binaries on my laptop which were compiled as 32-bit. They still run perfectly on my 64-bit kernel. That should obviously continue. Um, so we have a compat layer. We, we say, oh, this system call was defined with 32, you know, it has a pointer to a structure. That structure has 32-bit types in it. So we, 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 will, we will continue to support that. We will have conversion layers so that, um, you know, everything continues to work. And that's fine, but then people, when people were a bit smarter, they said, well, if we define these new system calls with 64-bit types in them, whether or not the, uh, the application is running in 32-bit mode, then we don't need a compatibility layer for this syscall, and everything will be better. And here I am saying, well, maybe 64-bits wasn't quite wide enough. So we are going to need to actually not pretend that 64 bits is enough for a pointer, uh, like this example, clone args. Uh, this is, this is an arg these are the arguments to the clone three system call. Um, so I, 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 I've, I've annotated uh, in, the, in the comments uh, which ones are okay and which ones are actually pointers. And they are pointers, not addresses. I went through and, and checked and we do in fact store to the, uh, the, the, the addresses there. So the pointers, not addresses. Um, so yes, we, we will need to say, okay, that's, that's actually a pointer. It's, uh, it's, not, um, it's not a U64. So how do we do that? And I'm suggesting that we have a, a, a new type that we expose to user space called double underscore PTRT. And we have to put the double underscores on the front because we have to obey the, uh, the C standards for symbol visibility and symbol naming and so on. So that's why that's the double underscore. Um, and we just make that 32 bytes, 256 bits. It's more than we need. That's good. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know who's going to come up with something that says, well, pointers really need to be two, 256 bits. Um, there are academic papers out there that use 256-bit pointers. I think Intel may have even come up with a spec for something that uses 256-bit pointers. Um, hey, more than we need now, maybe not more than we'll need ever, but yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe more than we'll need ever, but that's okay. It's only memory. We've got lots of memory machines these days. Don't whine. <laughs> um, so back to the compat layer we had for a moment. We've only, the, the way it's currently written inside Linux, we only support one. Um, I, I, I would be very sad if that continues to be, I want to be able to run both 32 and 64-bit applications on my 128-bit kernel. So we've got a bit of work to do there. Um, 
And then further inside the kernel, we have a number of data structures which we lovingly laid out by hand, and they're just going to get completely wrecked by making pointers 128-bit, and indeed by making longs 128-bit. There's, there's all kinds of places where we sort of intermingle various types um, that we know um, are naturally aligned, and all of a sudden they, they won't be naturally aligned anymore. Oh, well. Uh, you know, struct page is going to be is going to grow to be larger than 64 bytes. So now it's going to be two cache lines and not one. Oh well. Um, there are drivers and uh, core bits of the kernel that have code in them, like hash ifs bits per long equals 64. Well, now they're going to have to grow a third place. So I don't know if we'll bother to develop tooling to to look for all the places which check. You know, is it 64 or 32 to say? or 128 maybe. Um, I, I suspect we'll probably just do that by hand. Um, I mean, this is fundamentally, this is porting Linux to a new architecture. We've done it a bunch of times. Um, we've rarely done it from, you know, we, we did it once from 32 to 64 bit. It was Linus. Um, he, it was an earlier time. Uh, so it, 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 was, it was easier back then, but we can do it again. We've done it before. Um, yeah, I think everybody who lives through the 32-bit to 64-bit transition. I'm, I'm sorry, Ben. Could you could you tilt the mic a little? Yeah, bit? sorry. Uh, everybody who lives through the transition 32 to 64 and the compact layer uh, probably thinks like me: never again. I think we should really automate the generation of the compact layer as much as possible, especially with all of the much more advanced tooling we have these days. We can parse data structures, uh, formats, and type information and whatnot, PA hole, you name it. I think we should really, really, really thrive to as much as possible automate it. Because it's broken, it's always been broken, always had bugs and corner case, we never quite got it right. Um, and it was so painful, so, so, so bloody painful. So I, I, I would put that, I, I personally, if I was in, in your shoes, I would put that as a requirement. In, 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 in my shoes, you say? Um, you're gonna lead I'm, 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 uh, so <laughs> I'm looking for someone to lead this effort um, <laughs> I, I have a few projects on the go right now as, as some of you know because you're getting flooded with patches from me um, I mean if, if nobody steps up to do this then I will um, I'm, I'm actually really hoping that uh, Aunt Bergman will step up and volunteer to do this because I think he knows the right people, he's got the right clout to, and I mean, he's, he's earned our trust to be able to do this kind of effort. Right? He's, he's worked on... No, it's, 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 it's not that I don't like Aunt. <laughs> I love Aunt. Oh, fantastic. Be careful, he's on he's, the chat. Yeah, he's on the live stream, so he sees you. <laughs> what, 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 what does he think? Um, so I, I wanted to talk about, while we're waiting for Aunt to type, um, I, I, the, the RISC-V people have a 128-bit extension, which is sort of, really, it's a placeholder. I, I read through some of their documentation. It also says, well, nobody's ever done a 128-bit CPU. We really don't know what we're going to need. Here's some space for it. Uh, maybe they have more up-to-date documentation than that, but that was the most recent thing I was able to find. And, and I think that's fine. Like, I'm, not, I'm not mocking them at all. That's, that's, that's several steps further than any other CPU architecture that I've been able to find. Um, we're going to need a compiler that targets 128-bit CPUs. Again, this is something which has not happened before, and you know, there's there's going to be work to do. Again, I was hoping the GCC people would be here. Yeah. So there's a response from Arndt. I don't know if it's to your question. He types, we also mentioned having more than one combat a ABI in the long talk yesterday. This may have to be a step we do first. After we can deal with what having x86-64, uh, ARM64, x86-32, ARM32, syscall calling conventions in a single kernel, we can add the more complex translation. Ah, uh, yes, yes, this is from the Loon people, what, the Loon Arch people. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't able to make, make it to that talk, I had a conflict, but uh, I, I did read about it later. Yeah, so they, they, they have various compatibility days that they want to do. And, you know, absolutely, that, that, that's, that's a step in the right direction. And it's an easily decomposable project from everything else that needs to happen to get us to 128. Um, 
the the other thing i'm hoping to accomplish with this talk is to get people talking about it to get cpu companies to the point where they're like yes this is something we are going to do. We are going to help move the computer industry in the direction of 128-bit. We understand it needs to be done sooner rather than later, and we're going to have it in real CPUs that you know are manufactured on like two nanometer process or 1.3 nanometer processors in five years' time. Um, you know that, that 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 would be fantastic. That, 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 that's where I really need to go because I'm I'm signing the CPU companies up to do some work here, and uh, I. I are you yeah. sure we want to do that? You sure we want Itanium 128? Of course, I want Itanium. No, I mean, you know, the, the real CPUs that still exist, right? Um, I've, I have, I, I've had mixed success in talking to CPU companies about this privately. Uh, one of them uh, literally laughed at me, and one of them said, "Yes, we've had some in interesting discussions about this internally, and we are very, very interested." So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to have more responses from other CPU companies that are less laughter-focused and more, "We're going to turn this into a future product." Um, I, I shan't name the one that laughed at me, even though you know they deserve it. Um, so yeah, my conclusion: avoid the huge pain of physical address extensions and large file summer hacks by moving to 120 registers soon. We need to get moving on this. Uh, it, it isn't too late to start. We, 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 we still have time to avoid it. I, I know it looks kind of stupid to be, to be doing this in 2022 when we're going to need it in 2035, but people are still making four gigabyte 32-bit machines today, and we just, need to, we just need to make the pain of doing that so for on in the in the 64 bits so high because linux doesn't support it that nobody thinks about doing it. it's just like oh yeah i'll buy a 128 bit cpu it's only one cent per cpu higher than the 64 bit cpu yeah i'll eat that cost rather than putting millions of of uh, programmer hours into fixing all of the code um so questions dave again <laughs> question. Um, have you talked to Microsoft yet? <laughs> I, I, I haven't talked to Microsoft. I believe we have a Microsoft employee in the room. Um, but are, are you talking about Windows specifically or are you talking? Yeah, about... Windows. Yeah. Because we, they decided to do 64 bit differently than we did. Oh, that, that, that's a really good point. Yeah, the, the, the Windows 64 uh, bit model is pointers are 64 bit, longs are still 32 bit. And I, I forget what integer type they have. Is it long, long for? Yeah. No, I, I haven't talked to Microsoft about it at all. I assume. Well, I was about to say. I assume, actually, I have, I, have, I have no idea. That, that that will be a really interesting problem for them to solve. <laughs> because I mean, we're, we're kind of in the same situation as them, right? We we have legacy code. They have legacy code. Unfortunately, they are different problems of legacy code but um yeah they've i mean yeah they've been through it before it's going to be painful for them it's going to be painful for us um again but i mean for that for them the longer they have to fix up their problems the better the same as us you know they also did an alpha port uh, probably roughly around the same time we did an alpha port um yeah pain it's, it's always pain it's just you know making sure the right people Reducing the amount of pain throughout the industry is, I think, where both Microsoft and we will agree. Um, unfortunately, that, that does shift the pain to the CPU companies that we don't actually have any control over. Um, but hopefully we can, we can move things along more expeditiously than the industry moved to 64-bit. Question from the bridge? Yeah, I think Art wants to say something. I'm yep. not sure if it's technical. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. So um, I think we have two two really hard problems here that we might want to separate. One is running the kernel itself with 128 bit pointers and longs, and then the other one is running user space with an interface like a user space interface using 128 bit pointers. Um, so we might want to start with keeping a 64 bit kernel but adding the 128-bit AVI um, rather than doing the, the other part first and then adding the compat layer 
at the same time as trying to get anything to work at all, which is hard enough. That, that, that's a really interesting suggestion, Arne. Thank you. I, I hadn't thought of that. I, I had simply assumed that we were going to do uh, 128 bit kernel with 128 bit user space, and we would never support 128 bit user space on a 64 bit kernel. But you're suggesting that actually that is what we want to do, and, that, and that's a really interesting idea. Thank you. I think Linus had, the same, had this suggestion originally about uh, Cherry and Morello saying that we want to keep running a 64 bit kernel, we don't want to throw everything in the kernel overboard just for an experiment while we're trying to get 128 bit pointers in user space working. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think your mic's working. Could we get the other mic to... Uh... So besides pointer authentication, uh, address, address layout randomization, and uh, possibly like files that are bigger than planet Earth, right? Um, like the power cost of... 128-bit uh, systems and also the memory cost are like significantly higher, right? Because you're basically doubling everything, right? So is that actually going to become like a viable platform? Well, with the expectation, like pe people said that about 64-bit, right? I mean, I, if, if, if you go back to, to the mid 90s, people were saying, no, with the 64-bit pointers are too expensive. What we really need to have, and indeed, um, DEC implemented 32-bit uh, personalities so that you could do, uh, th you, you could, for your, on, on your DEC alpha, you could pretend pointers were 32-bit. You had a 32-bit personality where only the bottom four gigabytes of your address space was used. Um, because that was, I mean, if, if you look at the, the spec CPU benchmarks, there are some which do perform better if they're compiled as 32-bit executables. Nobody cares. People just don't care enough. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take the bridge first. Okay, uh, maybe Jessica uh, wants to comment on uh, Cherry BSD and then your complement. Yeah, so this was just to follow up on um, Ard's point about um, doing 128 user space on a 64 bit kernel. Um, when you're dealing with 128 bit integers, the problem's not too bad because you just, you know, you just take your 64-bit pointer, shove it into a 120-bit variable, and you can get away with it. Um, you still need to be slightly careful because um, you know, void star in the kernel is no longer big enough to hold what user space is using. Um, you have void double underscore user star that helps you a bit to automate sort of conversions for, I want this thing to now be a 128-bit pointer. Um, but you need to be a little careful around the um, compatibility interface, but it's not too bad. Um, in the context of Cherry Morello, which you said Linus was talking about, it's a lot harder because um, you can't just treat a 64-bit integer as a capability because it's not a valid capability, it's still just an integer. Um, and there it gets much more invasive to try and do what we call a hybrid kernel. Um, so it's what we did in Cherry BSD for a long time for the exact same reason that it seemed attractive of, God, there's a lot of kernel code it sure would be nice if we didn't have to make it all work just so we could run user space. But we found that you end up with a lot of annotations all over the place to say, no, this pointer that you think is a void star is really actually a capability, not your 64-bit integer. And so in the short term, it's quick for getting something working, but in the long term, you never want to have to maintain that thing because it is such a massive diff that you have to upstream, um, or in our case, keep downstream and maintain uh, indefinitely. Thank you. Appreciate you dialing in. Yeah, so I was going to reply to actually to you here, actually. Um, there is a use case that keep creeping up, uh, and these things have, uh, have existed in people's minds already 15 years ago, which is to have unified address space at large 
across a large amount of machines. And with the uh, arrival of technology like CXL, for example, this is getting more and more of a reality. So, and in those contexts, this is really where you want extremely large address spaces uh, because you effectively want to collect the address space of potentially a very large amount of systems in one unified space. So, and I suspect that kind of use case might become more common in the world where we have a 128 bit. Like my response to that would be just like, um, like in those systems when you have such a large address space, right? To reasonably assure that you, the reliability of that space is still there, right? When you access it, kind of like breaks the constraints of actually having like, um, like a reliable pointer to that space. Do you know what I mean? Like you're you're thinking of a machine that's so large that you can always address this by a pointer, right? But when you get to that scale, the reliability of such systems almost like mandate you that like kind of yes and no. They don't they don't necessarily need to be enormous. It also sometimes boils down to the way the hardware choose to organize pointers by sticking. Uh, geographical location bits in upper bits, and you run out of upper bits actually pretty quickly uh, because of the way you use them to identify uh, package nodes, CPUs, potentially other machines. And so uh, it's not necessarily that far fetched. And the reliability problems can be addressed if your link has enough amount of error correction and whatnot on it. And then the, it becomes a completely different problem anyway. Um, but there is people who want, for example, to be able to borrow memory for neighboring machines if that machine is underutilized and, uh, the, and the current machine is overutilized, for example. And that, those sort of, uh, uh, there's a quite a lot of demand for that because memory is so expensive uh, today in, in, uh, in our systems. And having larger pointers make a lot of these things more realistic at scale. Uh, and again, not tomorrow, not in five years, but uh, it is I think, a case where it might be worthwhile as well. So I think we have time maybe for one last question. Does anyone? Okay, well, if... Uh... Nobody has. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for not laughing. <laughs> <laughs>